Nothing is better than you. Sing it out. Oh, there's none. Nothing is better than you. Graves to gardens. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into ashes. stay a captive You couldn't stand to see my chains And so you came to be my rescue To part the waters in my way Death to life, from dark to light. Jesus, you show me what freedom is. You called my name, you broke my shame. You are my deliverance.
Bibles this morning, would you take them and turn with me to the book of 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 16. This morning we're beginning a new series, The Life of David, we're calling The Rise and Fall of a King. We're going to do this over the next seven weeks, we're going to look at seven scenes out of the life of David. Now, David was not a perfect man. Nor was he an utter failure. He's mentioned twice in Scripture as a man after God's own heart. As children, um, growing up, the most famous scene is a picture of David and Goliath. And uh, next week, we'll see if we can find a Goliath. I don't know who that would be. But anyhow, we'll... We'll deal, with, we'll deal with that. We'll see if we can slay a Goliath next Sunday. Um, the, the purpose of the Old Testament is for us to be able to take it and learn for it in our own lives and for us to be able to see today the character of God revealed throughout time and that the character of God hasn't changed. And so as we see the principles in the life of David revealed what you're going to see are principles that apply just as much today as applied in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Um, so today we're going to talk about how God calls and chooses a king. Um, let me give a little bit of background by way of introduction for a few moments. Um, the people had asked for a king. They wanted a king. They wanted to be like the other nations. And the Lord had a different plan. His plan was that he would continue to lead them as he had. He brought them through uh, the wilderness, pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. But because the people continued to ask for a king, ultimately the Lord relented. And the Lord allowed them to have a king. Because every other nation around them had a king. And Saul was their first king. He was the answer to the people's desire for a king. And ultimately, we'll see today that Saul is rejected. Saul took this person, Samuel, who was the prophet, took this very personal when Saul was rejected. And Samuel was the prophet. He sees the king Saul being rejected and he thought this had something to do with him. Why was Saul rejected? So we're in chapter 16, in chapter 13, chapter 14, and chapter 15. All three chapters previous, because I'm really good at math. In chapter 13, there was a sin committed by Saul. In chapter 14, there's another sin committed by Saul. In chapter 15, there's another sin committed by Saul. Do you see why he was rejected? In every preceding story, Saul chose to disobey God. In chapter 15, at the very beginning of chapter 15, what you see is, is that the Lord says concerning the Amalekites, destroy everything and destroy everyone because of how evil they are. Saul goes in, leads the people, keeps the best stuff, keeps the king, and disobeys the Lord. And then he hides it, and then he justifies it. He openly disobeys God. Now, we could be very critical of Saul. It's meant, I just was. And yet, how many of us have sinned, hid it, and then justified it? 
th that's, that was Saul. And Samuel comes along and Samuel confronts him because when Samuel comes, Saul, Saul says, hey, I've done everything right. And Samuel says, why am I hearing the bleeding of sheep? Bah. I think that's what a sheep sounds like. Bah. Because he knows. The sheep he hears, they got that from the Am Amalekites. Why am I hearing the things I'm hearing? Oh, 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 well, we just kept the best. He hid it, and he justified it. S Samuel says, well, I'm going to go home. And Saul says, no, 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 no. In chapter 15, he says, don't go home. I need you to come and stand beside me because here's what Saul was interested in. And I, I'm, not sure, I'm sure you, none of you have seen this in politics. But all Saul was interested in was his political image. And he needed the prophet to stand beside him to make him look good. And Samuel, in effect, saying, I'm not going to embarrass you said, I'll stand beside you, but I'll never see you again. And he went home, and he never saw Saul, say that three times fast, I ne he never saw Saul again for the rest of Saul's life. Would you be kind enough to stand with me as we read the Word of God? Start in chapter 16 and start with me if you would in verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, How long are you going to grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I'm going to send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If, Saul's here, if Saul hears it, he's going to kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I'll show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves. Come with me to the sacrifice. He consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Let's pray. Father, I pray in the next few moments your Holy Spirit would do a work in our hearts. May we be obedient to you today. I ask this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Notice with me Samuel's trip. Lord tells Samuel, notice verse 1, Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Samuel's grieving over Saul. And remember, he took this personal. He took it personal that Saul is being rejected. And, and I would want you to know, every time a person fails, God never fails. There's a difference between people failing and God failing. People will always fail you. If you're married, your husband will fail you. If you're married, your wife will fail you. If you have kids, your kids will fail you. If you, your parents will fail you. Your pastor will fail you. Everyone, your boss will fail you. Your employees will fail you. Everybody will fail you. Are you depressed yet? Okay. Everybody's going to fail you. Why? Because we are, we are among broken people. And broken people who are broken will not always do things right. We will ever now and then mess up. Saul failed. Samuel took it personal. And the Lord says, how long are you going to keep grieving? I've rejected him. The Lord, he says, I rejected him. Then watch this statement. Fill your horn with oil and go. I have been trying to work that into a sentence all week. I'd love to be able to tell somebody, fill your horn with oil and go. I can't work that one into a sentence. But here's what he's saying. Get on your horse and move, baby. We got a new day coming. Something, something, something new is about to happen. Fill your horn with oil. We're about to anoint a new king. And go. It's a new day. And he says, I'm going to send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. This is the first time Samuel's heard God has zeroed in on a man. 
He's never heard this before. All he knew is Saul's rejected. He doesn't know there's something new. Just so that you know, every time God has tore down something, he's in the process of building up something. He's always in that process. And Samuel is, if you would, the search team for the new king. And the Lord's the, the revealer of that new king. Samuel is sent by the Lord about 11 miles from where he's at to Bethlehem where the Lord has seen a new king for the nation. Samuel has, if you would, two practical problems. Let, let's, let's notice the practical problems in verse 2. Samuel immediately sees it, verse 2. Samuel said, how can I do this? If Saul hears this, he's going to kill me. Now, there's some practical issues right there. I, like, I'm going I'm to die if I do this. Why? Because, first of all, there was a geographical problem. There's a geographical issue. I'm going to show you the geographical problem on a map, okay? So, um, Rama, Samuel's hometown. That's where he's at. Where's Saul? Gibeah. Where's Bethlehem, where he's being sent? Right down there. In order for him to go from Ramah to Bethlehem, he's going to go right through where Saul is. And if he goes right through where Saul is with a, a bunch of oil that's for the purpose of anointing a new king that everybody's going to be able to see, I'm afraid he's going to have the ability to lose about 25 pounds of weight from the neck up. And that is Saul's concern. So he says, how am I, Samuel's concern, how do I get through and past Saul? Which goes to the second problem. The second problem is he's afraid. He says, I want to obey, but I don't want to die. Samuel's afraid of what Saul's going to do. So here's what the Lord says. Watch it. Verse 2, the Lord said, take a heifer. I just like saying the word heifer. Take a heifer with you. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. That's what you need to say. And you need to, when you get to Bethlehem, invite Jesse to the sacrifice. He says, and I'm going to show you what you're going to do. And you're going to anoint for me the one I declare to you. Samuel did it. He says, you go out there, you get a heifer, you, you put a lasso around him, you put him on a rope, and you walk with the heifer. And if someone asks you what you're doing, he said, we're going we're gonna to have ourselves a sacrifice in Bethlehem. He's telling the truth, but he's also not giving all the truth because of what's going on with Saul. What happens? Samuel comes to Bethlehem. Verse 4, Samuel did what the Lord commanded. He came to Bethlehem, and the elders of the city came up to him trembling and said, You come peaceably? Why would they ask that? If you look at the end of chapter 15, when Samuel hears that Agag the king, which, by the way, that's an awful name, Agag. But when you, when you see Agag the king is there, and he was not killed by Saul, what did, what did Samuel do? Samuel said, bring me a gag. And what did, he, what did Samuel do? He cut him up into pieces. So do you know what, if, if Bethlehem had a newspaper, do you know what would be on the newspaper headlines? Samuel the prophet is a hacker. He has hacked King Agag into pieces. And so now they see Samuel the prophet coming into town. They're like, hey, are you here peaceably? Or did you bring that sword? He said, I'm here peaceably. It's all good. Then, not only is he there peaceably, he said, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves. Come with me to the sacrifice. He consecrated Jesse and his sons. And Samuel leads in a time of consecration. What, what did that involve? I, I don't know, to be honest. Could have involved ceremonial cleansing. Could have involved praying. But now it moves from his trip to an evaluation. Look in verse 6. When they came, he looked on Eliab, 
Jesse's oldest, he thought, surely the Lord is on him. And Samuel, prophet Samuel, made a quick judgment. So the, the best prediction of future results in someone's life is past behavior. I'm, I, I, that's, a, that's a statement that I, I really believe. The best prediction of future results is past behavior. Now, I would give you this caveat. God can change people. But if you, if you take away that God, God's changing of people, if you really want to know what I'm going to do, look at what I've done. Samuel looks at Eliab and he says, man, that's a big, tall, strapping, good-looking man. I bet you that right there is the king. And do you know what happened a few years previous? The Lord had just given them a big, tall, strapping guy. And he was the king. Well, surely the Lord's going to give us just that same kind of guy. Big, tall, strapping, good-looking, GQ kind of guy. What this passage doesn't say in chapter 16, but we'll see in chapter 17 next week, Eliab was critical and negative, didn't like his brother. You, you don't see his heart. You see, you see how much he weighs, and you see how tall he is. You see his, how his face is, but you can't see his heart. Watch how the passage continues. Verse 7, the Lord said to Samuel, stop, stop, stop that. Don't look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I reject him. The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance. The Lord looks on the heart. Jesse calls Abinadab, made him pass before Samuel. Samuel says, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made Shammah pass by. He said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his boys pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord hasn't chosen these. The Lord reveals this principle. The Lord rejects all seven sons, and Samuel finds that the cupboard is seemingly bare. Um, I like sports. Steph Curry plays for the Golden State Warriors. and his, He's the son, son of Dale Curry. Dale Curry was an NBA player, and if you... Some many years ago when Dale Curry played in the, in the NBA, Dale Curry was a wonderful shooter. He played for the Charlotte Hornets, and Dale moved his family to Charlotte, and his son, Steph, was in high school, and his son, Steph, was a slight, slender build, and he led his team in Charlotte to win the state championship. He then wanted to go play for the University of North Carolina. But he was six foot two and he weighed 160 pounds. Let's, let me make that clear. He didn't weigh much. And the University of North Carolina would not look at him. So in North Carolina, if you can't go to North Carolina, you go to North Carolina State. North Carolina State wouldn't look at him. Dale Curry, was, his father was a graduate of Virginia Tech. So he, Dale called his former school where he graduated from Virginia Tech, and he said, hey, my boy here, he, he's a great player. Would you consider him? They said, well, he could come on as a walk-on. So they wouldn't consider even giving him a scholarship. His high school coach called Davidson College. Davidson College said, yeah, I know Steph. The coach did. He said, yeah, I know Steph. And I like what I see. He has great habits. He spends time in the gym. He's a gym rat. He's, he's, got, he's a man of, he's a young man of character. I'll give him a scholarship. In 2008, he led his team, Davidson, into the NCAA tournament. In the second round, played against Georgetown, big Georgetown Hoyas. And they were down 30 
points in the second round and Steph Curry caught on fire scored a total in that game of 38 himself to win the second round tournament against Georgetown like somebody saw something nobody else saw some of you know for those of you who are into sports you would know Steph Curry is one the MVP of the NBA he's someone well known with the Golden State Warriors today he had an opportunity to have a um, a shoe um, contract with Nike and did it from 2009 to 2013 millions of dollars at the end of his contract he asked Nike he said could I put on my shoe a verse and they said no. Steph Curry's response to that was, okay, then I'm not going to go with Nike. C character reveals itself in more than one way. So there was, a, there was an up, upcoming group called, called Under Armour. They started the sh in getting into the shoe market, and he signed a contract with Under Armour. And they said to them, "They said you you put it you put you can not only put a verse on, you can write the whole verse out if you'll sign out with us. We don't care what you do. We'll just do whatever you want. And we, you, we just want you, please." And he did. He has his own shoe with a verse that's out there because the point of that part of the story is it's just to understand character reveals itself even financially because he walked away from X dollars and chose these X dollars what if we could see how God sees that I, I, I don't I can't see you on the basis of how much you your, the shape of your body and the height and the color of your hair and the color of your eyes. But what if I could see your heart? The Lord looks on the heart. As a matter of fact, he specifically sees in David a man after God's own heart. It, look, if you're in 1 Samuel 16, turn to 1 Samuel 13. It's a couple of pages off to your left. 1 Samuel 13, we will, this is not going to be on the screen, 1 Samuel 13, look in verse 13. 1 Samuel 13, look in verse 13. It says this. Samuel said to Saul, you've done foolishly. This is after the first sin that's recorded. 13, 14, and 15, he sinned in each chapter. He, Samuel said to Saul, you've done foolishly. You've not kept the command of the Lord your God in which he commanded you, for then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. Verse 14, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you've not commanded what the Lord commanded you and then you get to chapter 16 this is the man after God's own heart the Lord was looking for this man okay, okay, okay. the Lord was looking first at a man's character not at, at his height and weight and the Lord saw here a man after God's own heart. And I, the question then becomes, well, what is that? Let me give you two descriptions of what is a man after God's own heart. First, the, the first is, is that a man, a man who is after God's own heart is a man who is when confronted with their own sin, they will repent and not hide. So when David commits adultery with Bathsheba, and he murders Uriah. And ultimately, Nathan the prophet walks up to David and he says, you're the man who had the choice of your own women, but you went and took another man's wife. What was David's response to say, you're a liar? No, he immediately repented. The issue is not, will we sin? The issue is, is once we sin, what do we do? When you blow it, the person who has a heart after the Lord will repent and not hide. 
And the second is this is a man who pushes into the Lord, a man who desires loving intimacy with the Lord. Is that what you desire? Do you wake up each day saying, man, I want to spend time with Jesus? That's a man after God's own heart. I mean, if the last time you read your Bible was last Sunday when we stood to read the Bible, that's not a person after God's own heart. A person after God's own heart is a person who gets into the Word of God because I want to know the person who wrote this. Okay, okay. Did you notice that in 1 Samuel 16 so far, David has not even entered the picture? They're looking for him, but he's not here yet. So watch how David enters. So, verse 11, Samuel said to Jesse, uh, Hey, is this all you got? Are all your sons here? He said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he's keeping sheep. He's, he's in the nursery. He's, he's watching the kids. He's babysitting. That's what we would say today. Okay, today we would not say they're keeping sheep, but instead he's down in the basement watching all the kids. Uh, Samuel said, uh, you better send and get him because we're not going to sit down until he gets in here. He sent and he brought him in. Now, now watch this before I finish that statement. David that morning woke up working with the sheep, completely unaware that that day his life was going to change forever. He had no idea. So before I go any further, I want you to understand that if you're a person who has a heart to, to just draw near to Jesus, let me, let me give you just early advice. Draw near to Christ knowing that tomorrow may not be any different than the day before but also knowing that if God wants it to be different, tomorrow everything can change on a dime. Because my life is not my own. My life is his. So it's whatever he chooses. So tomorrow morning I may wake up. I just want to pursue him, and wherever he takes me, yes. David woke up, and now he's being told, hey, Dad needs to see you. And by the way, this seems like a pretty big deal. The prophet's in the room. He walks in. Notice the description of him. It says in verse 12, he was ruddy, and I'm reading out of the English standard, he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. It's interesting to me, Samuel wrote this, that Samuel's description as he writes this is still a physical description. His, his description is, he's ruddy, means light-complected. He was light-complected, he had pretty eyes, and he was good-looking. It's like Samuel can't not look at his, the outward complexion. And then what does he say? Watch it. This is getting good. The Lord said, arise, anoint him. This is he. And now, now, now picture it. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the middle of his brothers. I just wonder whether or not there was some jealousy there. Can you picture that? He takes the horn of oil and he has David get on his knees and he pours the oil over his head. And oil is coming off of his head. And could you, I don't, Look, look this, is, this is my sacred imagination, but I just wonder whether or not Samuel put his, his mouth near David's ears and he said, you're the next king. And David raised his eyebrows. Remember, he just woke up that day doing what he did the day before. Doing what he did the day before that. He just, wanted, he just wants to be obedient to God and get to know Him. Notice, notice the end of verse 13. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah, which means Samuel went home. 
he did his job. David would continue to do his job until the Lord, because the question is, well, what, what's David do right now? Does David go and measure the drapes to become the next king? Nope. Did you know between now and when he would actually become king would be about 12 years? About 12 years. He'll be 30 years old. It's believed he was 16 to 18 right here. He'll be 30 years old when he finally came. And so you know what he does the next day? He goes out and gets out with the sheep. Let me finish the sermon with this. Here's some application. I'm going to give you four or five things. One, sometimes the Lord gives us what we ask for to show us we shouldn't have been asking for it. That's what the Lord did for the nation of Israel when he gave them Saul as king. Sometimes we're asking for stuff, and then we get it, and we're like, I, I, to be honest, I see this so many times in relationships. Some guy's dating a girl who's not a Christian or who is ungodly, and they just they are flabbergasted in lust. And they, Lord, I really want this person if you really want them you can have them and then after they have them they wish they could do a trade in are, are you picking up what I'm putting down and there are no trade ins available once you say yes I mean, because that, that's when they come to my office and sometimes people say well I married the wrong person and I'm like once you married them they're the right person okay once you married them they became the right one. Sometimes the Lord gives you exactly what you asked for to show you you shouldn't have been asking for it. Second application is this. Don't judge people by what you see. Look deeper. Look deeper. There was a gem dealer who took his two boys to one of those rock places where you could buy rocks in Arizona. He thought about not going. This was in 1987, the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show. He looked into this box, and there was a blue-violet stone the size and shape of a potato. calmly as possible he reached over and he picked it up it was at fifteen dollars was the price on it and the guy the moment he picked it up he said i'll sell it to you for ten he looked at it and he knew what it was he didn't have ten dollars on him he had no money on him but his wife had given five dollars to each of the two boys he had with him and he said, boys, I need your money. And he got the $10, promising to give it back to them. And he bought the stone. That stone has since been certified as a 1,905-carat natural star sapphire. Largest stone of its kind. It was appraised at $2.3 million dollars. It took a lover of stones to recognize that sapphire's worth. Just like it takes the lover of our souls to recognize the true value of what ordinary looking people look like and something beyond the surface. So when, when you see people who they don't look like much, let me tell you a 30 second story. I, I was in homiletics class. The study of preaching is what that is at Tennessee Temple University in 1990. And I walked up. Nat Phillips was the professor. Nat Phillips, I love Nat Phillips. He's my favorite professor. But I walked up right behind him. He, Nat, Phillips, Nat, Nat Phillips' pastor jumped off Baptist Church 
on Mon Eagle Mountain. I've always wanted to pastor a jump off Baptist church. I'll leave that right there. But I walked up behind him. I was supposed to preach that day in class. And I, he was talking with three or four fellows. I, I preached one other time in class. And Nat, Nat said to those guys, he said, I'm telling you, this guy, he don't look like much, but he can preach. And then all of a sudden it hit me. He's talking about me. So I became the guy in my own mind was, he don't look like much, but he can preach. But do you know what I really appreciate about Nat? He didn't care what I looked like. He didn't care what I looked like. He just wanted me to be a better preacher. I really appreciated that. Third is this to change your past results so maybe you've chosen like Saul we've got to change our future way of doing things look at people's hearts look deeper look beyond fourth character and a desire for spiritual intimacy should matter to us more than anything that we can see in other people so when you see character is that thing that people do when no one's looking it's that they're going to do what's right at all times when you see a person of character they may not be the most um, skilled and gifted person you've ever met elevate character because if they are the most competent person and they don't have character it don't matter character matters lastly just do your job and know that God will change your assignment when he chooses and if you don't have a job let us help you find it like if you don't have a job for the sake of the kingdom a uh, couple of things one you can go to northwoodschurch.org backslash serve and you'll see options northwoodschurch.org backslash serve you can see options about where to serve secondly you, you, you may I, I believe if you're a follower of Jesus Christ you have a spiritual gift you, you may be in a situation where you don't know what your spiritual gifts are I would say from next week on, you could go to the next step tables and we'll help you um, by giving you uh, tools for the purpose of, of finding your spiritual gifts. Because we want you to understand where your giftedness is. But if, you, if you're serving, then just keep serving. Don't check out. You may say, uh, Bobby, I, I'm pretty broken. On December 4th, 2017, there were 400 musicians gathered in the 23rd Street Armory of Philadelphia to perform the Symphony of a Broken Orchestra. It was by David Lane. The orchestra included amateurs, professionals, and even members of the storied Philadelphia Orchestra. The youngest performer was nine years old. She was a cellist. The oldest was an 82-year-old oboist. It was probably the most diverse orchestra in America. The 400 brought with them broken instruments, a trumpet held together with blue painter's tape, a violin with no A string, a bow that had lost most of its hair, a cello carried in multiple pieces. The government had cut funding for music programs in public schools, and many school instruments fell into disrepair. But David Lang made something beautiful out of broken instruments. As the musical piece opened, many of the instruments were silent, and gradually they found their voices. While the trumpet might not be capable of a sound, the keys could tap a rhythm. The scraping of a bow over the silhouette of a violin body could add an unusual element. He pieces all of these things together. You can read about this at my Facebook page. I posted the article there in the church 
each broken instrument adds to its own voice in the symphony. The best that some can do is simply tap, squeak, you're needed. May not, we, you, you, may be, you may be like me, you may not look like much, but wherever you are, you're needed. Just tap and squeak. Just tap and squeak and let God bring us together. Would you bow your heads? This morning, I just want to ask you, when you look at people, is it your first sense to judge them by what you see or do you look beyond the surface checking for character and how much they love Jesus do you try to get to know them I want to encourage you let's spend time and recognize that character matters Let's be a people. We're just going to stay in. We're going to fight through. We're going to keep doing our job. Where did David go after he was anointed? Right back out with the sheep. He went right back out with the sheep. Just keep doing your job. Just keep serving and loving. you're struggling today I want to encourage you right now let's let's admit that struggle to the Lord let's ask him to be at work in our own hearts if you've never put your faith in Christ he came for us who are broken that we would know him while we were still sinners he died for us you can call on him and know that he will receive you, accept you, and forgive you. But he wants all of you. Right now, you can ask him to come into your life, forgive you of your sins, and to save you. And he'll do that. Father, I come to you today, and I'm grateful for your grace. I'm grateful for how you love us. And Father, I pray that, Lord, we would be a people who follow you and are obedient to you. Forgive us for where we fail you. I thank you for grace. Help us. Lord, we would be a people who are after your own heart. And forgive us for where we haven't been. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, Bobby. appreciate that. And... Uh... As he mentioned, we'd love for you to respond to the message this morning, however God would lead your heart to. The pastor will be down here at the front if you'd like to talk with him about any decision you'd like to make. Uh, also, one of our elders is at the back. And, and Bobby mentioned uh, serving and discovering your spiritual gifts. I'm going to be back there, too, if I can help in any way to do that. He mentioned the site, northwoodschurch.org slash serve. Um, you can find ways to serve. It looks different on a, a handheld phone. Or on your phone than it will on a personal computer so if you take it on computer you'll be able to see a layout of every person you could call in the church and find a place uh, to serve or if we can help do that we would love to do that but I'll be back there as well and for any decision that you need to make would you make that this morning also uh, those who are watching online or you can if you're not able to get to one of the tables you can go to the virtual connect card by texting the word connect to 812-214-1987 and uh, you can let us know how we can, uh, we can serve you with that. There are a couple of announcements. They're all mentioned in your bulletin here uh, um, in more detail. But a couple of things we just want to mention here before we close this morning. Uh, one is uh, we're doing something called the Northwoods Family Experience uh, Experiment. The, our church is providing for families a... Um, an experiment that you can do as a family, and then there is a video Bible lesson that you can watch and a little uh, a lesson that you can do together. 
And we'd love for you to be a part of that if you'd like to. It's very easy to, to sign up for that. If you're interested in being a part, you can sign up on the Connect card, and we will get the, uh, the information to you, and, uh, and you can participate in that with your family. Be careful. Don't blow anything up with that. Um, there's a lesson in that as well. Uh, the family experiment, you can sign up on the Connect card. Also, the Sweetheart Prom is coming up on March 13th. Uh, we'll have a, a, a good time together. Uh, if you'd like to sign up, it's uh, the student ministry puts that on, and there is a silent auction to benefit Northwoods mis Missions. Uh, but let us know on your Connect card if you'd like to attend. Our next Northwoods class is coming up very soon, Sunday, March 7th. These are after our 1045 service. And this is how you can find out how to become a member of Northwoods Church. Make this your church home, and we'd love for you to be a part of that. You can sign up on the Connect card and let us know that you're doing that. Also, our church is... Church emphasis this year is on prayer, and we are encouraging prayer in several specific areas. Uh, last week, last month was on families. This month, February, is on praying for yourself. If you look in the scripture, you find Jesus and Paul, many others, praying for themselves. What do you pray for yourself? Is that selfish to pray for yourself? It's not. Uh, the scripture tells us to do so, and we have a uh, prayer sheet on the tables on your way out that you could pick up that gives you an idea of what to pray for yourself uh, we're going to be praying the armor of God for ourselves um, and that kind of tells you how to do it it gives you an example to do that and so if you'd like to take that and put it in your Bible and use it as a prompt during your times with the Lord feel free to do that uh, as I close this morning I'm going to be praying for us and, and uh, praying for the armor of God we're in a spiritual battle and we need to be prepared for that uh, I think those are announcements uh, that we have. We're going to receive an offering as we close this morning, and we're doing it at the doors with the offering boxes. You can drop your Connect cards or any uh, offerings that you want to give, tithes or offerings there. You can also give online at northwoodschurch.org backslash giving, um, and, uh, or you can text to give, texting the word give to 812-214-1987. And I think those are announcements. Uh, I think we're done for this morning. Would you stand with us? And we're going to pray this morning, and, and like I said, I'd like to pray for us, praying the armor of God uh, to face the spiritual battle that we face this week. Uh, thank you for being here this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful for this day. We're grateful for the opportunity to be together, to encourage one another. And uh, Lord, I pray that we've been encouraged by your word. And I pray for that you would help us to be fit for the battle that we face this week, the spiritual battle that the scripture says all of us are engaged in. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, help us to, to fasten on the belt of truth. Lord, that we would, we would walk in your truth. We would not listen to the lies of the evil one, but we would, we would believe what you say is true. Lord, I pray that we would, we would uh, put on the breastplate of righteousness, that we would be right with you and do right by other people. I pray that our feet would uh, be prepared with the readiness of the gospel. We would do everything that we can to live and to share so that people would come to know you. Lord, I pray that we would take up the shield of faith, that we would take you at your word. We would trust what you say is true more than what anybody else says is true. And Lord, we would put on the helmet of salvation that we would we would know for certain of our standing with you and that we would, we would walk with you each day because of it. Help us to take the sword of the Spirit, uh, which is the Word of God. And Lord, that we would put your Word into our minds so that we're thinking your thoughts. And Lord, I pray that we would conduct our lives in a spirit of prayer, praying at all times, keeping alert in prayer, praying for all the saints. And Lord, I pray that we do so, that we would stand firm in you. Lord, we pray this for Christ's sake and for his glory. Amen. Thanks, everybody. You're dismissed.